Hi there. My name is Gary Friedman, and I'm the author of the ebook on the Sony Alpha 7 and Alpha 7R. These two cameras are like having a medium format camera that fits in your coat pocket. What do I mean by that? Have a look at this highly detailed cloth. I was taking shots of this using a macro lens. Amazing detail that you can get with it. Of course, you have to use the best lenses available to get the most out of it, but if you already have legacy glass or the new Zeiss Primes, then you've already got what you need, and these cameras are amazing. The reason for the high quality isn't just a high number of megapixels, it's the larger sensor. And let me show you what I mean. Actually, if you're looking at this video, you probably know this already. These are two cameras of similar size and similar weight. This one's the Alpha 7 from Sony. This one's the Olympus OMD EM1. They look the same on the outside. They have similar features, but the Olympus OMD, let me show it to you here, has a sensor about that size. That's a micro four thirds. The sensor on the Sony Alpha 7 on the other hand is much larger. It's the same size as a 35 millimeter negative. Was that an easy thing to do? No. Even though you can say, yeah, just drop a sensor in there. It's not a big problem. From an engineering point of view, it was very tough because in order to feed a live view sensor, you have to pull all those megapixels off the sensor and feed the live view. And then every time you take the picture, you gotta feed it all over and move it to the memory card. A lot more data is being moved around and that requires a lot more power. Being able to do that with a very powerful CPU, graphics engine, and a teensy weensy battery is an engineering marvel. Why do they make the battery so small? I don't know. If they made it any bigger, then it wouldn't be a Hasselblad that you can fit in your coat pocket. I can tell you that I'm changing batteries so often out in the field that I don't even bother putting the battery door back on. It comes off so you can use a vertical grip. I just keep the battery door off all the time and swap batteries just like that. Easy, simple. So anyway, having finished the 612 page book on these two cameras, what I'd like to do with this video is share with you some of the unobvious but very worthwhile settings and features which won't necessarily be found by exploring the menus alone. The first one, when I first got the camera, I was very disappointed because all of my previous cameras allowed me to reassign the set center button here to be a spot focus and hold. So in case you were shooting sports, it would be an AFC mode. You'd shoot, shoot, but for some reason, either it got confused by the subject matter or whatever. You just want to be able to say, focus on that right now, and you go back to your old focus, recompose, and shoot mode. Being able to press the center button was out in the field was the way to do it. And yet, uh, there doesn't seem to be any way for this camera to do it. Instead, they had something else uh, signed by the factory and I'll talk about that in just a second, but it turns out you can. It turns out you can. And let me show you how it's done. Let me just plug this in here so you can see what's going on. So you don't really find it in a menu, but what you can do is assign it. This is in the gear menu on number six. This is where you can configure all the customization for the camera. You can change all the items which show up in your function menu. And down here, you can change what function gets assigned to what button. So go to gear six, custom key settings, and then for the control wheel, no, you want the center button. There it is for item number two. Normally at the factory, it's set to IAF, which I'll talk about in just a second. Turns out you can assign it to a mystery feature called standard. And there it is. If you were to set it to standard, then the old behavior goes back. You can be in AFC mode, which is what I'm gonna do right here. So I can go out in the field and shoot in whatever mode I'm shooting in. And if I wanna go back to my focus, recompose and shoot mode, which I've been doing ever since the 1980s, it's, it's ingrained in my brain. I just go and press the center button and I'm back to my old way of thinking. But you cannot press the button the way that you used to doing it on your older cameras. On the older cameras, you're probably used to doing it like this with the ball of your thumb. This is such a small camera that's really, really difficult to work that way. It turns out this camera was designed so that you actuate it with the first joint of your thumb because that's where it normally falls. So much easier to do it that way. Once I realized that and you can reconfigure the button, I'm like, great. When things get really tense and I'm working under pressure, I can go back to the way I was trained and the camera behaves the way I want. Pretty good. 
Now, what you're doing when you reassign the center button is you're giving up a brand new feature called IAF, which is where instead of, in addition to face detection, instead of just focusing the whole face, the camera will try to focus on just the eye. Why didn't they incorporate that in face detection as part of the feature? Why do you have to press the button? That, I don't know, but that's what they did. I find the focus, recompose, and shoot. Setting it to standard is a much way, better way to go. Now, as you're perusing these menus, let me plug this in again. As you're perusing these menus and you're looking for things to assign to buttons, there's a couple confusing items that come up. Some of them sound like they're doing all the same thing. For example, let me go to the menu here and let's say I want to reassign the C3 button, the trash can button on the bottom right of the camera. So we go to custom key settings. We'll go to down button, let's say, where is it? Custom button three, custom button three, there we go. Obviously, otherwise known as the trash can button. So it says focus settings. Now there's also focus area and there's a couple other focusing mode. What do they do? And especially what is, how does focus settings differ from focus area? Let me tell you that now. Focus area does what you think it does. I mean, let me assign it there. There we go. So I'm out shooting. I press the focus area button and it brings up the focus area screen. And there it is. And you can choose. And this is exactly what you expect. What does focus settings do? Well, let's go and assign it. Custom key settings, custom button three. Let's change it to focus settings. Now focus settings will do two different things depending on whether you're in autofocus mode or manual focus mode. For example, I'm in autofocus right now. I wanna hit the trash can button. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna bring up a little icon in the lower right hand corner. That's its way of saying, it's another way of choosing the focus area, zone, wide, center, flexible spot, all that. It's just a different user interface. But let's say you're in manual focus mode. I'll just press the AFMF button on the back of the camera right there. And now I'm in manual focus mode and now, if I bring this up, if I press the trash can button, it brings up an orange square and it says, okay, this is gonna be for the manual focus assist where you get zooms in. So let's say I want to, let's say I'm, I'm shooting with legacy glass and I push the uh, trash can button. There's the orange square, I press the center button and then it gives me five seconds or a little bit longer to zoom in and focus on, fine tune what I'm doing. Then it goes back to wide shooting and then I can take my picture. Wow, what a gorgeous picture that is. So that's what the button does. It does two different things. If you're in autofocus mode, it lets you choose your focus area very quickly. If you're in manual focus mode, especially if you're shooting with legacy glass, then it allows you to, uh, the same button will then uh, give you the, uh, uh, the manual focus assist. That way you don't have to go and reassign buttons all the time every time you change lenses. All right, next, vertical grip. You won't find out about this in the manual, turns out. Vertical grip can actually be a very handy thing. I bought it thinking it would be great to balance the camera with big lenses, and in fact, it works that way very, very well. And you got two batteries inside, so you don't have to worry about the battery life quite as well, quite as much. But end of the day, you wanna go recharge your batteries, you gotta take the whole thing off and take the batteries out and charge them all individually. And because this camera didn't come with a charger, you gotta put it in the camera and plug it in with a USB and then wait four hours and then swap batteries and then do it again. It's a pain. So what I did was I got myself an external charger and I, I just, I, I, I rarely use this anymore. However, the nice thing I got about it is the lesson about uh, keeping the battery door off. It just became a, a natural thing. Okay, another thing about the architecture that most people don't realize is that there's no depth of field preview needed on cameras like this. The reason is, oh, depth of field preview, for those of you who shoot SLRs in the past, whenever you wanted to find out how much would be in focus at a given f-stop before you shoot, you'd press a button on the bottom, usually it's down here by the lens, and it would show you what would be in focus. It would actually stop the lens down to the f-stop you're gonna be using, and then let you see. F-stop, the, the viewfinder would become darker, but if you look even more carefully than that, you'll be able to see things more in focus, in front of what you focused on and behind what you focused on. These cameras don't need it. The reason was, this is designed from the ground up. The E-mount was designed from the ground up for video. So you're always shooting at the f-stop that you're gonna be using. You're always looking at your viewfinder at the f-stop you're gonna be using. None of this uh, mirror flips up, f-stop closes, shutter opens, shutter closes, f-stop opens, mirror flips down again. 
it's always stopped down. In fact, you can look at some of these pictures, you can actually see this in action. Uh, let me put this camera into aperture priority mode here, and let's see if you can see what's going on. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, I don't know. But I'm gonna switch this to F8 right now. It's right now it's F11, so it's very, very tiny. Can you see the F stop moving? But that's how it works. So there's no depth of field uh, preview needed. However, if you go through the menus and realize that that's a function that you can assign to a button, the reason is in case you have an LAEA4 adapter like this and you have an old-fashioned A-mount lens attached to it, because phase detect needs to have the f-stop open all the way, that function's needed, so that's why it's there. You can assign it to a button if you want to. Next, there is a... If you go to the menus, there we go. It's in the suitcase menu, submenu to display quality, standard and high. What does this do? Have you ever played around with this? You, you look through it with your camera and you can't see any difference on either the LCD screen or the EVF. What's going on? High quality is actually taking more pixels from the sensor and feeding it to your live view display. The LCD is such low resolution that you really can't see the difference. The EVF, which has a higher resolution, you can see a little bit more of a difference, but only a little bit. If you look at something that's very, very high in detail, you might be able to see a little bit more, more quality. Is it worth it? The answer is no, especially when you consider the fact that uh, I took my trusty multimeter and I actually measured the power consumption in both of these modes, a standard and high. High takes up 20% more power than standard does, and it doesn't look 20% better. I would keep this setting set to standard and then move on with your life. So those are some of the unobvious things that I found out about this camera. These are just some of the insights that you'll be able to learn with my new ebook on the A7 and the A7R. These are the kinds of insights that can only come from someone that has used the camera day in and day out. Here are some of the other things that you'll learn by buying this book. One is I have an entire chapter on my personal camera settings, and I've been playing with this and fine-tuning it for quite some time, uh, and uh, I explain why I have everything set and under what circumstances you might want to change things. I mentioned some manual focusing tricks for those of you who are using Legacy Glass. It makes manual focusing much easier than in the old days, and it's not an obvious combination of, I mean, it is an unobvious combination of uh, two or more settings. I talk, I have a whole complete chapter about adapters for all the Legacy Glass, so if you have Canon, you have Nikon, you have contacts. Here are the most popular adapters for those and some caveats and some insights into how to use it with this camera and what settings to use depending on your adapter. In addition to all that, I talk about how to use the zebra stripes and special notes on differences on when you're using them for stills and when you're using them for doing movies because the, uh, the color palette for both and the dynamic range of both are different. You want different settings for each. Finally, I'll talk about the four different low light modes and how they all compare so you know which one to use if you don't have a tripod and the light is low. And of course, I'm famous for the chapter on the wireless flash, the single best tool you have to add an element of wow to all of your images. That's what wireless flash can do for you. A lot of people ask me, Gary, why are your ebooks so expensive to compare to the competition? The answer is simple. My books are the most comprehensive and thorough. Nobody else goes into as much detail as I do. It's 610 pages for crying out loud. My readers tell me that my explanations are easier to understand and occasionally entertaining, so that's a good thing too. This book gives you insights you won't find anywhere else. If there's a problem or deficiency with the camera, I'll tell you that too. For example, have a look at this. I was shooting a trikathon using the A7R. Using this lens, a focus tracks fine. However, when you press the shutter release button down, it stops the focus tracking. And because of the can't do the electronic first curtain shutter, there's an eighth of a second lag between when you press the shutter release button and when it actually takes the picture. That means I was able to get a whole slew of rear tires of the tricycles in focus, but not actually the front ones. That's a problem. My book talks about that. If the other guys aren't saying these things, you have to ask yourself, what else aren't they telling me? Anyway, all of my ebooks come with a two-week risk-free trial. Read it for two weeks. If you don't like it, let me know. I'll give you a full refund. The purchase price includes a three-file bundle, a PDF, which you can print out, copy, and use on all of your computers, a Mobi file, which you can use on your Kindle, and an EPUB file for all the other readers. There's no, uh, there's no DRM, there's no copy protection of any kind from my website. You pay for the content, it should be yours. Printed books are also available too, but 
the best bargain, really, for less than one and one half percent of the cost of the camera body are the ebooks. So check it out. You can find a whole array of ebooks at the FriedmanArchives.com/ebooks. Thanks very much for joining me.